start. All right, so like I said, we're going to continue with this study uh, of the book of Galatians, getting into chapter 4. Remember chapters 2 and 3, Paul's starting off his letter, getting pretty quickly to the point of the issue, the reason why he's writing this letter, of being there's Judaizing teachers that have come in among the brethren of Galatia. They're having an influence on them, taking them away from the doctrine, from the gospel of Christ, to a different one, to one that uh, has those... Um, Judaizing principles, or the, the principles the Judaizing teachers are trying to get there, those things, the old law, and Paul is dealing with that, okay? And so we're going to continue with that. He, he starts off in chapters 1 and 2, laying that out there at the beginning, but then get into a defense of his apostleship. There is, uh, appears to be this um, attempt, and, and I think we're going to see a little bit today, Paul brings it up here in chapter 4, uh, but a, an, an attempt to tear down his character. Tear down his apostleship, really, and uh, to try to influence them to believe this doctrine that is not the doctrine of Christ, not that which he preached, that which has not been had not been revealed by the Holy Spirit, that which is not true. So he deals with that in chapters one and two. We get over here to Galatians chapter three and four, and he starts dealing with the defense of the gospel. Okay, and so um, he and, and I made this point last time that I taught on Sunday whenever I was going through Galatians two. The defense of his apostleship is not separate apart from the defense of the gospel. Keep those two go hand in hand because as an apostle, he's the one that is teaching and preaching by means of uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of Christ. And over here he gets to chapters 3 and 4, so he's defending his apostleship. The message he's preaching is from God. Then he gets over in 3 and 4 and he goes through what that message is and he starts talking about the fact that we're not justified by the works of the old law. Are we justified by? Justified by faith, right? And so he lays out a series of arguments going through chapters 3 and 4. It starts off in uh, chapter 3, 1 through 5, talking about the personal argument. Okay, And Jeremiah went through chapter 3 on Wednesday, talking about the personal ar- argument, how they uh, receive the Spirit, and from whom they receive the Spirit gets over into uh, 6 through 25. Some scripture argument, the example of Abraham, the curse of the law, priority of the promise over the law, and the purpose of the law. And that's really where we got to. We got quite all of chapter 3. We got to the end of it, got down here to verse 25. But that really is okay, if you will. I mean, uh, we got um, working through some things as we're going through chapter 3. The reason for that is because the end of chapter 3, verses 26 through 29, flowing into chapter Four verses one through seven are really one uh, point. The, the, we have a continuation of those things. So he's going to continue his argumentation of why we are justified by faith, not by the old law. And there is where we get to this practical argument, if you will. Okay, starting in verse twenty-six. So let's twenty-six through twenty-nine, talking about the fact that in Christ they are one as children of God. They are Abraham's seed. And heirs of the promise, okay, heirs of the promise. So he, he's laying out these things. He's just coming off talking about the fact that it can't be the old law. Lays out some various arguments like we talked about there um, in chapter 3. Talks about the fact, though, just prior to this, um, the old law had a purpose, right? Was the old law, the Old Testament, what the Judaizing teachers are trying to teach that they keep, did it have no purpose at all then if we're not to keep it at all? If today we're free, separate apart from it, then did the Old Testament have no purpose whatsoever? What was the purpose of the Old Testament? It was a tutor, right? The Old Testament did what? I mean, it was a tutor, but it pointed to what? Christ. And that was it the whole time, right? Wasn't that the point of the Old Testament? That's what... He's going to get into a little bit of that here when we get down into chapter 4, right? So it was pointing towards Christ. So everything about the Old Testament is useless. It had a purpose, and its purpose was to bring us to Christ, right? To be that tutor, he says there in verse uh, 24, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified. Uh, back up into verse, I believe it's, it's 23, But before faith came, we were kept under guard by law. This is in chapter 3, verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by law, kept for faith, or kept for the faith, which would afterward be revealed. In other words, 
During the time of the old law, we were kept under guard by it, and it taught various things, right? It was a tutor. There were teachings, teachings about God, his character, who he is, the fact that we need to be obedient, all those types of things. That was there. The Jews had it, and it was all pointing towards Christ. It kept them under guard until what came? Christ came, right? Till the New Testament, till till that time, till Christ came, and the New Testament came. In other words, the whole point wasn't that we were going to be under the old law. The old law was there, though, to bring us to Christ, right? It was leading us to that point. And so then, after he says that, we get into verse 26 through 29. And the point being, down in verse 29, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Again, those in Galatia, they were being influenced by Judaizing teachers, but many of those in Galatia, what were they? Were they Jews? They were Gentiles, right? So he's speaking to Gentiles and saying, you have the opportunity, and we're going to get into heirship and them being sons here in a minute. Again, this all flows. You have the opportunity to be an heir. You became an heir not through the old law. The old law pointed to the fact that all were going to be heirs through who? Christ. It was all coming to that point, right? And as a result of the coming of faith, this New Testament of Christ, we see in verse 26, you are all sons of God through who? Through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ put on Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. That was the whole point of the old law, right? Flown from the purpose into what it led to. It was a tutor, a tutor to what? To bring them to Christ. But that wasn't for the Jews only. It was for all, right? The Jews had that there, but it wasn't just to point the Jews to Christ. Everything was bringing uh, uh, what was pointing towards Christ so that there was this opportunity. In other words, what I'm trying to say is it wasn't just that the Jews are the ones that have this opportunity. Okay, So he lays this out. Okay, Christ, we are one. It was not through the old law. Okay, It was not through the old law. It came through Abraham, yes. Those promises were there, but those promises were always pointing towards Christ. Then he gets into chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. And like I said, it's a continuation of the same argument. Because what did he just lay out? He just lay out, we are, we, he just laid out, laid out, rather, we are all one in who? Not through the old law, right? Through Christ. We're all one there. We become heirs. Through what? Christ. Not the old law. That's what he just established. So then he gets here in verse 1, and he says, Now I say that an heir that I just laid out, both Jew and Gentile, have that opportunity to be an heir. Okay, But he says that an heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, through the, uh, though he is master of all. So he starts talking about this idea of the fact that uh, we have this heirship. Okay, He just laid out that Gentile and Jew both have the opportunity to be heirs. That's through Christ not through the old law. Verses 1 through 7, I kind of want to bring out, I believe the point that he's trying to get to is what he concludes with in verse 7. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Again, we're heirs through Christ. But again, the old, the old law didn't have no purpose whatsoever. So he starts talking about this idea of that they were, uh, there were those that were child or children and that there were those that were slave but he makes a, uh, a distinction between the two, and this is really question number one. How does an heir as a child not differ at all from a slave? Right. First of all, who's he talking about with the child and the slaves? Who, who would he seem the language to be pointing to as he's working down through here? Who's the child or the slave? So as he, he, it seems like a continuation of that conversation. And he says, now a child is not an heir so long as he is a child. In fact, he doesn't differ at all from a slave. Why not? And this is number one of your questions. What did you guys get? That's right, Jason. They're both complete authority. They're not able to act on their own. A child doesn't have any more... Um, uh, rights, if you will, or he doesn't have 
any more authority, as Jason was saying, than a slave does. Why? Because he's still a child, right? And that idea there is an, an, an infant one who is under this guardianship. He says there in verse 2, but is under guardians and stewards under, uh, until the time appointed by the father. Back up into chapter 23, ver, uh, sorry, chapter 3, verse 23, but faith came, but, when faith, uh, but before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, right? So during that time, whenever the old law was there, the Jews were under it, but did that make them any different? Did they have freedom in Christ? Or did, did, did they have freedom or any of those kinds of things? I believe that's the point that he's getting at, okay? That a child does not differ from a slave at all. Um, they have not received the inheritance, and they're not gonna, going to receive it until the time appointed by the father. Now, when does that time come as you continue on through this section 1 through 7? When Christ comes, right? He says down in verse uh, four, but when the fullness of the time has come, God sent forth this son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons as sons. So the law didn't give the Jews any kind of upper hand. In fact, what did he say they were still under, verse 3? Or they were still in? They were still under, verse 3. Even so, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. What does it have to do with? How are they, Jews, still in bondage? They had not been redeemed. They're still in sin. And, and I believe that that's the point that he's getting at, right? Remember, the argument that he's making is we're justified by faith, we're justified by Christ, we're justified by the new not the old law. And I'm making this argument that, that both Jews and Greeks have an opportunity through Christ, through faith, not through the old law. And one of the things that he's pointing out is back before the old law, it had something. It served its purpose. It was pointing towards something. It was pointing towards Christ where all can be made sons, all can become those heirs. But whenever that old law was there, they were still in what? Bondage. Where am I? That's exactly right, and that's the point that he's trying to make throughout this. And, and you really see this come up time and time again, the fact that the old law with these Judaizing, these Judaizing teachers are trying to teach, it's not a part of the doctrine that he gave, so it's nothing that needs to be kept at all because it's not a part of the doctrine of Christ. And to think that, you well, okay, it might not be under Christ, but we still need to keep aspects of it, that, 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 that it is required, it is not. And what it does is it just keeps you in bondage is the aspect that he's bringing out, right? Go back to chapter 2, is what I'm trying to kind of point at. Chapter 2, and in verse 4, uh, those, the Judean teachers came in, we're talking about this um, a couple weeks, or sorry, about a week ago on Sunday, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ. So they have freedom through Christ. They came in to spy that out and bring us back into bondage, or bring us into bondage. Well, what's that bondage? What's the old law? Because the old law didn't have any ability or capability to free one of their sins. If one was going to be right with God, they had to keep the whole law perfectly. We see from Romans 3.23 and elsewhere that no one did. The only one that did was Christ. But the fact that you're trying to go back to these things that had no ability to cleanse you or, par or, or, or purify you. And I think Jeremiah pointed out Hebrews, uh, I can't remember if you said none, but it's really the whole point of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. Really getting into chapters 9 and 10 is what? 
the New Testament or the new law is better than the old law. Why? Because in the old law, yeah, you did these things. They're able to make you ceremonially clean, uh, cleanse. Uh, you kept these various things that were there. But the new law is better because what does the new law do that the old law couldn't? Cleanse you of sins, right? And that's the whole point of what Paul is trying to say. We're justified by faith. We're justified by this new law. We're not justified by the old law. And whenever we go back and try to keep these things, we're going back to those things that whenever the Jews had it, uh, before the new law came about, they couldn't be made clean by it. Yet you're still trying to go back to this system that had no way of keep in mind as we go throughout we're going to see bondage throughout chapter four as we go throughout chapter four uh this idea of bondage comes up multiple times it came up in two comes up in four and comes up in contrast again whenever we get to chapter five because after he makes this whole argument here that there's this system that you're trying to go back to the the judaizing teachers are trying to get you to go back to this system is a system that keeps you in bondage. That's put in contrast to what in chapter 5, verse 1? Stand fast, therefore, in liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Right? That's the point. You're trying to go back to this system that, 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 that kept one in bondage. One was in their sins. One could not do anything um, to make them so, or, or there, there was no way, sorry, within that old law to be able to be clean. And what you're doing is you're throwing away the new system that we're supposed to be standing fast in the liberty of, which is Christ, the freedom that is there. Yet you keep on going back to this system. And that's what he's pointing out here. That system that even whenever the Jews had it, okay, even whenever the Jews had it, they were not able to be made clean. And in fact, holding the whole thing, uh, bringing the whole thing together, the end of chapter 3 into chapter 4, the old law was never meant to be the system. It was there for a period of time, kept them under guard, all pointing towards Christ. And that's what it brings out in verse 4. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth, sent forth his son, born of a woman under the law to redeem those who are under law that we might receive the adoption of sons. I believe what he's pointing out there, especially in verses 1 through 4, uh, sorry, one, 1 through 5, is he's really talking about the Jews as he's going through there, right? The Jews were in bondage. The Jews were in sin, and they had no way to get out of sin. That came through Christ. Christ redeemed them, and that is how the Jews now can be heirs, adoption uh, as sons. But he doesn't leave the Gentiles out again because then he continues in verses 6 through 7. And because you are sons, I believe there's a transition there now pointing towards the Gentiles. And because you are sons, God has sent forth his uh, spirit or sent forth the spirit of his son in your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Both Jew and Gentile have the opportunity to be an heir. And it's not through the old law. Yes, it was there, and the Jews had it to point towards Christ. But that old law has now been done away with. How do we become heirs? How do we become free in Christ? How do we get this opportunity, as he states here in verse 6, to be called sons? God has sent forth the spirit of his son in your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. How do we have that opportunity? It's not through the old law, it's through the new law. Okay, Because the old law kept you in bondage. Now you have that opportunity to be an heir, to be one. And, and, and there, there are some different opinions here in verse 6 on what that uh, spirit, it's a capital S here. I believe it's, it's uh, not supposed to be. I believe the translator has got it wrong there. I think in verse 6, God has sent forth the spirit of his son, the disposition of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. In other words, now what do you have the opportunity to do? What can you now call God? Father, it's like the son was able to, right? One who now has that relationship with God. And, you know, I don't want, we can spend a whole lot of time. I'm already spending way too much time here on the first four or seven verses. But I know Harry makes uh, some, some good points there. And uh, on verse seven, uh, in contrast to what some have said, that that idea of Abba, Father, and it's more of a, a daddy relationship, completely wrong. And, you know, that, that's not what's there. It's a complete humble respect for that one in that position 
that is there, who you are calling Father, is the one of the heavens in the earth, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who gives us that opportunity. We now have that opportunity to, to be an heir, to be right with him, and that is both for the Jew and for the Greek. Okay, I'm sorry if you have comments on that, but I need to get moving because I got to get through the rest of this chapter. Okay, so then he, so he he lays out that argument, then he gets into this uh, sentimental argument, verses eight through twenty. And the first part of that, at least in our outline, the way that we have it uh, broken down or written out, is his fears over returning, over their returning to bondage. Again, we talked about bondage, but the fact that even the Jews were in when they were keeping this or whenever they had this old law because there was no way to be uh, to be brought out of it. He turns and he starts talking to the Galatians, uh, namely talking to them as, as coming from paganism, the Gentiles who were there, and he has fears over them that they're returning back to bondage. Again, he laid out that we're free from that bondage through Christ, but you're turning back to it. He has fear of this. How is it, though? How is it, though, that they are returning to bondage this being the gentiles brother not galatia right so you're turning to this system to try to be justified which is a system of bondage and it's no different from that standpoint right obviously the old law was given for a purpose, and it was given by God. So there it is different. But it is not different from the system that they were keeping, even in paganism, these weak and beggarly things, because no matter what, both the old law and this, you were still in what? You were still in bondage. So you're turning to, yes, this Old Testament. You're trying to keep aspects of the old law, because that's what the Judaizing teachers are trying to get you to do and to understand Yet it's no different from the weak and beggarly things, the keeping the months, the days, the years, all those types of things that you're doing with the Judaizing teachers teaching. It's no different because whenever you were doing that with your pagan worship, whatever, you were still in bondage. You are in the old law. You need to do away with that because what we're free, how we are free is through Christ. Now, I know, you know, we might need to stop and make the point here that that doesn't mean that we're free to do whatever we want. A lot of people will take this and just run wherever they want with it. That's obviously not. He's talking about the system or the doctrine that you're keeping. You're not keeping the doctrine of Christ. We're free in Christ. We're to uh, be obedient to Christ and do as Christ says. And it has nothing to do with the law, and you're trying to turn to that, Jeremiah. That's, yes, sir, go ahead, Senator. 
that's a, that's a good point, Aaron, because that's what he gets at in verse 11, right? I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. You've turned to this thing that I didn't teach, which is where he started the whole letter. It's a different doctrine. And I'm, I'm afraid that the work that I did is in vain, which would be a shot at, at them, right? Like, you guys don't know what you're doing. You, you, you think you're doing what's right according to what God would have you to do, but you're not. And I'm afraid that the work that I did in that is going to be in vain because by going back to that system, what have you done? Why, why would his labor be in vain? Because they don't know God. And what, what is the, uh, logic, what is the conclu- conclusion of that? How does work be in vain if they what? Are back in sin and have separated themselves once again to God. And that's what he's saying. Going to a different doctrine. And when he's laying all this stuff out and he tells them right in the middle of it, It's not just something that's okay to believe and it's just some discrepancies or differences here. It's something that separates you again from God and takes you back into bondage. If you don't know God, you have to be those who understand and return back to those principles that were taught. Did you have something you were going to say, Jeremiah? That's right, and that's, I mean, again, that's his fear is they're returning back to that, to that state, right, turning back to bondage, and um, all, all great points, and I appreciate uh, Aaron and Jeremiah both bringing that, bringing that out and pointing that out, so Paul's making this, the, 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 sentimental, the sentimental argument, and, and part of why it's under this uh, title, I guess, in the outline is a sentimental argument is because of what he gets next, he does start talking about their past and present relationship right Paul labored among them right I mean he was there he was working with them and so he has this fear for them and you you would think somebody like Paul I'm going to get to 12 through 20 here in a minute somebody like Paul who did that work with them was with them for a period of time as we're going to get to in a minute they showed their respect for Paul saying these things about where they are would have some meaning right he's an apostle and laying that out that I have authority as an apostle, so they should uh, have meaning anyways, but he's trying to bring to their remembrance uh, that thing that was there as far as what he taught, his care, his love, his concern for them, and he's fear, fearing where they are headed. And like Aaron was saying, that should be a wake-up call to them. Somebody with that much respect that they have uh, saying those things, but again, it gets to verses 12 through 20, their past and present relationship, relationships to him. So Paul, uh, again, arguing justifi- uh, justification by faith, points out, brings us up that he has fear for them, that they're returning back to uh, a state of which they were in, in bondage. He reminds them of his care for them. The work he did among them, he does there in verse 11. Like I said, lest I have labored for you in vain. He had been one that had labored under them. But he reminds them here of uh, their relationship and the work that he did and the care and concern that he had for them. Why does he need to bring this up? Or why? I know that this is inspired and he lays this out. Why? What would be there to be a cause to bring up this aspect as an argumentation of the Judaizing teacher's doctrine is wrong? 
which would indicate or seem to point out the fact that what's going on, and we pointed this out in chapters 1 through 2, what's going on? Why, why, why is Paul having to talk about this? Because what has happened to his and the uh, Galatians, the brethren of Galatia, their relationship seems to have had some sort of, when I say falling out there, there, there doesn't seem to be that uh, relationship that is there. Paul had been separated from them for, a point, for a, uh, a point in time. You get down into verse 17, and what does he say? They, pointing out who? The Jews, the Jews, they zealously court you, but for no good reason. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be zealous for them. And so, like Jeremiah said, he's bringing up this point, saying, look, the whole reason why we were close was because the teaching of the doctrine that, that, that was there, the closeness that was there was because of that uh, unity that we had. And now that I've been separated from you for a point in time, these Judaizing, te these Judaizing teachers have come in. They have started to tear down, uh, try to tear down his character, his authority, make him as he's not apostle, all those types of things. And he's trying to bring their mind back to, wait a minute, I taught you the gospel, and whenever I did, there was this closeness, and you had to care for me. You would have plucked out your own eye for me. Uh, even though I had this infirmity, you still received me. It was on the basis of that doctrine. And now all of a sudden, these guys are coming in, and they're trying to uh, take that away. They're zealously courting you, yes, but for, no, or, but for no good reason. And so that's what these Judaizing teachers are doing. He's, he's talking about the relationship that was on the basis of the doctrine. And you're going away from that thing. And you're allowing these Judaizing teachers to come into this. And I want to bring out uh, the point that I made here with this. Again, what was the reason for their closeness? Paul was there. He was working with them, yes, but it was on the basis of a unity growing within the doctrine. Guys, we meet here on Sundays. We meet here on Wednesdays. And we need to be meeting here every time that that happens. The point that I'm wanting to make is there's a lot of other hours in the week where other things can get in the way. And you can start getting people starting to try to pull you away. That's why there needs to be this closeness with each other. We have technology today to be able to call, to text one another. But to be able to have Bible studies outside of services, um, you know, I mean, have those things. Take those opportunities to get closer with one another in the doctrine. That's where that unity is built up because whenever you don't and you separate from one another, that's whenever Satan can try to find his way in. And whenever he finds his way in, his whole goal is to get you away from the doctrine of Christ, to try to drive away between those who are close. And so we need to make sure that, like Jeremiah said, we're studying, we're around one another, um, those types of things in being within uh, the doctrine. All right, so on that, I'm going to move on to uh, his last argumentation, all right, the uh, allegorical argument. So he lays out some of those things, lays out some arguments, <clears throat> um, some various arguments that are there um, as far as the heirs. We, we're all heirs under Christ. Some little arguments might be there. And then he comes and concludes with this allegorical argument. Um, at least in our outline, we break down into two sections. It, it's really kind of... The same thing, but 21 through 24a, an allegory for those who desire to be under the law. What, what, is the, what, what is the allegory? He makes an argument here based off of what? Abra <coughs> Sorry. Abraham, right? But going through Sarah and Isaac, Hagar and Ishmael, right? He talks about the fact, hey, y'all y'all want to be under the old law? Let's go back and go look at this. That's one of the things Jeremiah pointed out when he was going through his lesson. You know, he's talking about, let's look at what is argumented here as he goes through it. So he uses this allegory. And so they have this, and we have this contrast that is set up. Now, Sarah and, uh, well, let's start with Hagar and Ishmael. What are they representative of? Ishmael from Hagar, she's what? In this allegory, as he continues on and makes this application. Bond woman, right? She's a bond woman. Uh, or the, the bond woman uh, through flesh. What about Isaac and Sarah? Free woman, right? And that one being through the promise. Um, and, and again, these are being used for the background of a deeper, sorry, didn't mean to click off, of a deeper um, point that he's trying to make. So you have that. 
uh, wasn't a uh, through the promise. What's his? And he makes it in 24. The rest of 24 going through through, through 31. Ishmael is representative of what? The old covenant. What about Isaac? The new covenant, right? The old law, the old covenant from Mount Sinai. And what does that do? It keeps one where? Yeah, in bondage, right? We've been talking about that throughout. Um, it, it keeps one in bondage. What about new law from Jerusalem above? What does that bring about? Brings about freedom, right? Brings about freedom. And this uh, is the promise um, that we have of where freedom is going to come from. So we worked down through here and he lays this out. He quotes from Isaiah 54, verse 1, uh, talking about that once again, the promise that was there um, is what everything that what, what was pointed out. Remember, the Jews had done what? We just went through a study of Isaiah. What had the Jews done? Separated themselves from God, right? And sin and all those types of things. They didn't have a way to get back into a right relationship with God. God rejected them as a nation, but there was this promise right before 54 is 53. Promise who was coming? That was meant to be, I mean, that this promise was there from the beginning since then. Image through Christ, right? The Messiah was going to come. And that all nations, all were going to have that opportunity to be made right through him. And so, that's right. There, there, there would be that hope that would be there. That is not through the old law. It never was intended to be through the old law. In fact, the old law comes about after what had happened through history and time. It's about after sin that happens. The old law wasn't there to cure sin. If it was, wouldn't it have cured it back then, right? All it did was pointed one towards the Christ that was coming. And so he's laying this uh, groundwork out, um, or sorry, lays all this out, includes down in verse... Um, 31, so then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. In other words, he's using this allegory, this background story of Hagar. She was a bondwoman. Yes, there was a son to Abraham, but did that change Hagar's state, being a bondwoman? No, she was still a bondwoman, and so would Ishmael and his descendants from that standpoint. But Isaac was through Sarah, which was through the promise, right? And so laying all that out, he comes to the conclusion here that we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So in other words, that old law has been done away with. We're not going to go back to it. We're not going to keep it. We're going to keep what was promised, which was Christ to come, the new covenant, the new law. And that's why he makes that. Uh, he, so he lays all this out. He lays out all of his argumentation, justification by faith. He ends it here. And then he says again in verse 1, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ made us free. Therefore, since it's not the old law, it's justification by faith, stand in that faith. And he's going to now lay out in 5 through 6 some practical application and some various things as a result of the fact that we're justified by faith. We're justified by Christ. All right, thanks, everyone, for your participation uh, and, and help through that. Again, questions for Wednesday, Chapter 5 are up here.